guests, I think we're about to start. Uh, distinguished guests, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good friends. Uh, my name is Robert Cooper. I had the honor uh, to be uh, the alternate director and the member of the board on behalf of Poland and uh, uh, wider Europe constituency, the member of the board of Russian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And I have the honor and pleasure to be the moderator of today's meeting with our honorable uh, guest, uh, President uh, of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, Jim Lichin and his staff. Warm welcome and of course, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, President Jim, to accept an invitation to the meeting of the uh, Polish Income and Business uh, Community. And let me express my gratitude to the organizers of today's meeting. Um, okay, uh, let me express my gratitude to the organizers of today's meeting, uh, Sobieski Institute, Angelika Bartek. Um, applause. Also, Stock Exchange, uh, I think the president of Warsaw Stock Exchange will appear soon. And let me also thank the Ministry of Finance for help and uh, assistance, uh, the former um, the other director, the Polish directors in the uh, National Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, Thomas, Jacek, and Katarzyna. Thank you, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, let me invite uh, to the stage uh, the head of uh, the Department of International Cooperation in the Ministry of Finance of the uh, Republic of Poland, Thomas Kudrzewski, to tell us a bit more about uh, the perspective of Polish government, the activities of the bank, as well as to welcome all the participants of today's meeting on behalf of the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Poland. So, Thomas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Radek, and I would like to thank Institut Sobieskiego for hosting us here and, and Radek for arranging this uh, meeting. Uh, I am very glad to, to be able to join you in welcoming President Jim in Poland for, for the second time in your capacity. Uh, I was actually involved in negotiating our uh, agreement to join the AI back in 2015, together with Mr. Jacek Dominik, who is sitting over there in the first row, who later became a director in the bank's board, representing Poland and few other European countries. Uh, we saw the establishment of this bank as an interesting concept aimed at promoting uh, development of Asia, which we thought was an important goal of EU's and Poland's development and foreign policies. Since joining the EU in 2004, Poland has been increasing its own development aid activities and wanted to support this new institution with its capital contribution, which was around 166 million US dollars in cash. So quite a significant amount, reflecting also our rising economic strength. In the same time, we thought that while focusing on Asia, the AIB could also become active in Europe, especially in the context of promoting uh, connectivity between the two continents. This is happening. Bank financed a project in Hungary and has one in Romania in the pipeline. So we look forward to a project in Poland as there are vast investment opportunities, for example, in the energy and climate area. As we all know, private and public investment is a process that requires financing and support. And market financing is not always enough or available. So not only countries like Poland, but also the most developed ones, utilize loans and other financial instruments granted by international financial institutions with AIB among them. The bank started with 57 member countries and today has more than 90 members and 40 prospective ones and operates on five continents. I believe this shows the momentum that started with the establishment of the AIB is still there and the bank has become a global player on par with ATB, EBRD, EIB and others. We are very glad to be part of of this and to have an active relationship with the AIB. 
I congratulate and thank President Jin and your staff for your efforts and for continued interest in our country and regular dialogue between us. Thank you very much. Yes, President Jin, and uh, please now welcome you to the stage to tell you what is about the president's activity preparation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank Jude, also PS Esco, uh, Kiergo, for hosting this event. And I know Mr. Jude Sobias Kiergo uh, has played a very important role. And, um, and I think uh, it's uh, our great honor and privilege to be associated with you and try to have a dialogue with you. Now, first of all, um, uh, let me tell you that I visited Poland. Uh, quite a number of times. More than 30 years ago, I was here for the first time. And of course, the second time, uh, early in the 2000s, and the third time uh, when the bank was up and running in May 2016. And this is the fourth time. So I could see, first of all, earlier in the days, the change in the physical infrastructure of this country. But the recent visit uh, gives me more, a more impression that Poland is changing in a much more subtle and visible, invisible way. You are certainly not possible to change your physical landscape every year. But you are doing more and more important things, playing more and important roles in the EU in reforming the international financial architecture and in playing a role uh, in this part of the world and in uh, working with the rest of the world uh, to promote peace and prosperity. So recent years, the change is more subtle, more significant. Uh, particularly, uh, Poland is the first of the Central and Eastern European countries which decide to join this bank. Joining is not the right word. Joining is more or less passive. You become part of an institution, of a system, when it was set up. But Poland played an important role in conceptualizing the governance of this institution. You played a direct role in setting up a very high standard of governance and a high standard of economic social development. And, and ever since the bank was up and running, you served on the board directly uh, guiding the management in carrying out this development businesses. They, <coughs> Not many people in your country understand what a great role you have played already. And a part of the reasons I come here again is just to get uh, the message across to your public. That's why I gave it to you, to your media, and to let them know how much Poland has been doing in setting up and promoting the international financial architecture, in helping Asia and other countries developed. And I think the Polish people will be very proud of the role they play. Um, the bank uh, started with 57 founding members, now 106 uh, after seven years of operation. It's not hard to understand why the bank's membership keeps growing. The only answer is the new, member, new countries members are attracted to it because they believe this is the model of the Development Bank great in the 21st century who promote growth and peace in Asia and beyond. The bank was designed to be a model of 
development bank in the gene pool of the Moldavara development banks. We should not be far too different from the World Bank, from EBRD, ADB. We should not, because our genes are part of this gene pool. But it makes no sense for us to produce a new local development bank, which is simply a clone of the existing institutions. There must be some special features. These kind of features could, to a certain extent, set the bank apart from the legacy institutions, but not too much, so that we still remain and be recognized as one of the multilateral Vietnam Bank family. And I am proud to say, thanks to the support of the shareholders, thanks to the support of the board, and thanks to the concerted efforts of the bank's management and the staff, all the way to rank and file, we are now recognized as one of the first class multilateral banks. We had very little cooperation with the World Bank, EBRD. We hosted actually EPDI's office in China, providing free rent to EBRD. And we also work with ADB, and we are looking for opportunities of working with African Development Bank and Inter American Development Bank. For the single purpose, NDBs need to work together. With concerted efforts to deal with climate change, to deal with imbalanced development, to reduce the digital divide between developed and developing countries, and to improve uh, the livelihood of the people, and to improve gender balance, to empower women, and to create a great future for the children. This is what we intend to do, and uh, one of the one of the basic principles or the values of this bank is being lean, clean, and green. Being lean, we want to stay fit. We want to avoid institutional obesity, and we have to be careful. And then institution grows like a human body. There will be more cholesterol level going up, more fat put on the body, and there will be less fragile, less active. Second is clean, zero tolerance for corruption. We will not allow public money to find its way to the private pocket. We are very strict. I think that's the only way for you to convince the shareholders it's an institution worthy of your support. We keep in mind all the money comes from the taxpayers' money, from your, from our members. We have no right <coughs> whatsoever to waste a single cent. And the green, we promote green. We also have four Gs. Gs, global, we are a global institution. Forget about the title, Asian infrastructure. Asian. Asian is meaningless. Just like EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction Fund. EBRD works in Central Asia. EBRD is also working in Africa. This only indicates that some people in Asia would like to do something about this institution. And I said, no, 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 we don't want to change the title to A, it's triple A. It's good. And uh, <coughs> um, we, we want to be global. We we'll promote growth. Growth not defined in a traditional sense, only GDP numbers. GDP numbers may not be really good unless these numbers reflect the green economy. Unless the GDP numbers will be translated into the tangible results for the common people. So, global, 
growth, governance. Governance is the soul of any institution. In the absence of very high level of governance, no institution can survive the world. This applies both to public sector <coughs> and to private sector institutions. Finally, green. Again, we set the target to achieve by 2025 15% of the approvals for climate change mitigation and adaptation. We had already 56% last year, so we over uh, fulfilled the market check. By 2030, we will be provide financing at least more than 50% for private sector. Private sector and public sector, private sector and uh, green financing are actually mutual uh, reinforcement. We know that uh, the world by 2030 may need four to six trillion US dollars for climate finance. It's now 830, uh, 830 billion, 83 billion, it's, it's much, much less, okay? So uh, for $630 billion annually today, to go all the way up to four to six trillion by 2030, it's almost impossible without engaging the private sector. Every day, you have around two or three trillion US dollars moving around the globe, looking for very nice destinations. It's impossible for the government to finance all this for climate change mitigation and damage. That's why we'll be mobilizing private sector resources and financing climate change mitigation and adaptation mutually. Uh, reinforcing. So this is what we do. And finally, uh, I had uh, very big discussions with the finance minister and uh, uh, other officials. We want to do projects in Poland. Poland is an important country and you have a very important geographical advantage. You can play a bigger role linking Western European countries and Eastern European countries. You also are part of the corridor all the way to Asia. So we want to improve, uh, help improve the connectivity of your country, building, upgrading airports, seaports, roads, railways. Uh, certainly for a development purpose, that's important. And also, I think Polish people should understand they join this bank with a purpose, which is a noble purpose, to promote the reform of international financial architecture. But that's not the end of it. Polish people should benefit directly from this bank's financing. So our people are working very hard uh, with the authorities, with the private sector. And I think it's so important for us to have something to, to show for it. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. That was very interesting what you said about, about the future uh, projects uh, of the bank in Poland and in the region. And as, uh, Thomas already mentioned we have already two, one in Romania, one in Hungary. Uh, but as we are internet right now, uh, uh, I would like to address some general questions uh, to you. And uh, certainly, no surprise, the first question should be about Ukraine and the battlefields of Ukraine. Uh, it had a huge impact on the situation in Poland and the region, and what it was from the perspective of the global institution we were in, what was the impact of about the things of Ukraine and activities and operations in the bank, if you may uh, answer the first question. Um, when the war broke out in Ukraine on February the 24th uh, last year, uh, we suddenly felt immediately the impact on our bank with regard to the way we deal with uh, this issue. Most importantly, 
uh, how to deal with Russia and the guy works. Um, it is very much important for us to make sure that uh, the bank's normal operation will not be impacted. And since Russia is one of the big piece of numbers, uh, we also had uh, uh, many programs and projects for Russia. So when the war broke out, the first thing we do is to communicate with the Russian authorities and uh, discuss the situation with them and convince them that it is in the best interest of Russia and other members for us to put on hold all the projects for Russia and for Belarus. Uh, we, we told them that uh, uh, the bank will be seriously affected in our uh, ability to maintain the relationship with the international capital market. Uh, how many projects in Russia and Belarus? Uh, uh, Russia will be our number one project, our railway sector, but they keep paying us back. But we, we, we try to understand, help them understand that this is a monolateral with the bank. Every member should understand uh, we, need to, we need to work together and uh, we should not do anything which will adversely affect the operation of this institution. Okay? And we saw that problem. And the Russians continue to pay us back. We have one more project. But also the, the rest of the projects are but the other impact is on our members. For instance, some of the countries immediately uh, have the problems of food supply. Because you claim uh, supply the food to some of the both countries, such as, for instance, even Egypt. Okay. So we quickly try to, to, uh, to come up with some ideas of how to help some of these countries to deal with uh, the food shortage. Yeah. Third, because of the war, um, the geopolitical situation uh, deteriorates quickly, and uh, the indirect impact uh, was there. In some countries, normal um, uh, infrastructure and investment business would be affected, and uh, trade disruptions, and all this kind of things. So uh, we try to come up with a solution uh, that can help these countries to maintain their normal um, structures of infrastructure. But of course, this also happened at a time when pandemic, COVID pandemic, was in the uh, affecting uh, damages on the uh, numbers. So it is a problem that we have managed to deal with it. Uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, any institution would have to weather rough uh, times, but thanks to the support of the board, we quickly adjust it and we do things which will be uh, good for our members. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, President Jean. Uh, so let's move uh, from the geopolitics uh, right now to investment and to infrastructure. Uh, which is the main area of the activity and operations of the bank. Uh, that was already mentioned that uh, you are expecting new projects in Poland, and my question concerns that. Like, what uh, uh, role could the region play in the activities of the bank? Or how would the region contribute to the activities of the bank? And how the bank could contribute to the development of the uh, region? Yeah. You see, when we were inviting uh, many countries to, to join in the efforts to set up a new bank. Uh, the first idea we hit upon was to invite European countries. Of course, including Poland, uh, the Central Eastern European countries. Let me, let me tell you uh, the difference between our invitation to European countries to join, and Japan's invitation to European countries to join in the 1960s. 
And I, as you know, I worked for five years as vice president in, in the ADB in India. And in spite of the ice age between China and Japan over those years, I, I personally have very good relationship with President Dato Chino and uh, uh, Kuruda san who's now Central Bank governor of Japan. And we have very good and personal relationship. And then uh, Dato Chino told me, he said you know, in the 1960s, we wanted to set up the Asian Development Bank, which was strongly resisted by the United States, because the U.S. thought this bank was going to undercut the World Bank. And the uh, U.S. said, no, but, but after serious uh, negotiations with the U.S., finally the U.S. agreed, okay, we can be supported on one condition, that we are the same, we are on equal footing. Uh, symbolically, Japan has one more vote, one more share than US, but Japan will be the president forever and the Americans will be a vice president forever. That was the agreement. Finally, okay, go ahead. Then Japan came to Europe. For what? For money. The capital is one billion US dollars. Because Japan was, you know, in the 1960s, 10 years, a decade after the Second World War, Japan had little, little financial resources to create such a kind of institution. So we knock on the door of European countries for money. But they didn't knock on the door of the of Poland or Central Eastern European countries because that was part of the formal Soviet Union's skills influence. But they didn't reach to but they did work on European countries. Whereas we came to European countries, including uh, Central Asian countries, Central Eastern European countries, not for money. For what? For advice. For your role to set a bank with high governance standards, high social standards. This is the most exciting introduction that you can imagine. And in the future, in the United States will also be trying to do the right idea. Because if you ask the European countries to join, because if you ask the United States to join, then can you imagine that in the foreseeable future the US will join? Uh, I visited the United States uh, inviting the U.S. to join and uh, I also went to Japan um, to, to join them. I was twice in the White House and uh, a couple of times in the tre Treasury Department, State Department. <coughs> uh, the U.S. did not want to join. Uh, that's, their, that's their decision and uh, I, I think the sovereign government's decision or oh, we have no problem. Uh, and uh, Japan the same. So when uh, I, I went there, some of the officials um, told me I don't want to ident identify it. It's not perfect. And they said, Mr. Jin, over the last three decades, uh, you've been working very hard to promote the US China relationship. We appreciate that. <laughs> However, we're not going to eat the cake you made. We're not going to eat the cake you made. And I said, well, I come here to invite you to the kitchen. I invite you to come to the kitchen. Let's make cake together. And you know what kind of ingredients we put into the cake, what kind of, uh, how we cook it. So it's feel comfortable. And, uh, and I told them, and it's certainly a very difficult uh, decision for the United States to join a new development bank with developing countries and the majority shareholders, and China was a fixed shareholder. But the door remains open. Come, you come to our bank, you visit our boardroom, you find that we have 12 constituencies, but there were 14 seats. That's the exact answer. <laughs> Okay, um, um, Mr. President, we live in the era of uh, geopolitical tensions and technological revolutions, so it's very hard to predict anything. But if I may ask you a question about the future of AIB, how do you see the future of the bank? I 
what would you like to be in the next five or ten years? Even 4.0 is very hard to say anything right now because everything is changing. We will have a very hard times uh, with pandemic and also but so what role you see of the Indian infrastructure investment plan in the next five years or where would you like to be in the next five, ten years? Geopolitical situation keeps changing. And uh, and it seems to me, you know, when I look back over the last uh, seven decades after the conclusion of the Second World War, I could see probably uh, geopolitical situation is never, never, ever uh, like a calm sea. It's never calm. There are always troubles. Sometimes it's more rough, sometimes a little bit better. So for any political leaders of any country, what is important for you to navigate mm -hmm. the rough and tumble of the geopolitical situations. For the for the head of the Mobile Labour Development Banks, it's the same. Because our job is to promote equitable growth and development of these members. And our job is to promote um, the basic rights of the poor people to promote gender balance, empowering women, making uh, paving the path for a great future for our children and children and children. This is our job. Okay. It's not high sounding narratives, but this is really what we need to do. So when you say what we are going to do for the next uh, 10 um, years, we have already the corporate strategy approved by the board, which is, as I said, to provide financing for climate change and adaptation, and also to promote private sector development. That's the general picture. But to achieve this, we must maintain the high standards of operation. Our models of branding must be suitable for our mission, and we must maintain the credibility of this institution. That's, that's what we do. It's, it's way beyond 10 years. But for the for the ten, next ten years, of course, we need to, uh, to we need to continue to do things when we uh, set for ourselves. But you know, for a multilateral development institution, I think fundamentally, it's not just the financing. Financial resources are limited. Even you look at the combined assets. Of all the ADs put together, they are less than the assets of China Development Bank. Can you believe it? It's limited. But I would like to say, while the resources provided by ADB is a drop in the The splash it makes is huge. For instance, this time I went back to, to Washington uh, for fiscal meetings. IMF, World Bank, we are working together for the first uh, full fiscal board, uh, board meeting, and, and also other institutions come here. I can see. All eyes are on this meeting because of their mission to deal with the most urgent issue of climate change. It's clear and present danger. It's imminent, it's not something which is yet to loom large on the horizon. So, no private sector institutions, no matter how much money we have, could create such a kind of stage for everybody to come to talk and to consider what is the best one. This is the role of the NDBs. We work with other NDBs, and I think for the next decade, decade or decades, as long as we continue to mobilize resources 
to promote the basic investment projects which can deal with the development issues. That's the most important thing we can hopefully achieve. So my view is as a development bank, we should be both ambitious and we should remain humble. Because we have to understand our limitations. But our understanding of the limitations should not constrain us from being ambitious, from be from having the guts to do something which is enormously important for the human society. Yes, an ambitious investment infrastructure bank, AIB. Ambitious infrastructure investment bank. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we closed the first session, which was for the public, so we thank very much our uh, viewers of the internet.